Hi, Steve with Brownells with another From the Vault. And today again, we have a special guest, Tom Lum. Tom, welcome back. Thanks again, Steve. Thank you. You've got some nice looking revolvers there today. And you know, yeah. I'm, a, you know I'm a sucker for Smith & Wesson, so go ahead. I'll get out of your way, start. Uh, Smith & Wesson, uh, these are the solid frame swing out cylinder. Hand ejectors. Hand ejectors, as they call them. These happen to be pre-war, and they have adjustable sights. They were targets, and they made very few adjustable sights pre-war. They command a premium. These, these were the next generation in revolvers, and they had multiple lockup, and it's essentially the same gun that they make today. Uh, very strong, great design, great action, uh, and a hundred years later, they're this going a, strong. This is a K-frame six-shot 22, right? So it's a pre-Model 17. That is correct. A pre-war, they called this the outdoorsman. It had the adjustable sight, and it's what today is considered the K-frame, which is a medium-sized frame. Same gun here, except this one is an M&P, which they called military and police, but it's a 38 special instead of a 22. Other than that, same gun. Same gun. 1930s, 1920s. Nice, very nice. Now these uh, these guns have a few features you don't see on the new new guns. For example, well the the sight. Just start with the sight. Smith and Wesson went through about what five, six incarnations of this adjustable sight. Yes. They had some of these had a single screw back here for adjustment. Some had two screws. Um, I've seen a lot of different versions. This is a five screw gun, of course. You got one, two, three, four, and five screws. And it's got the lightweight barrel, no rib. That's a, that's a giveaway on a pre-war. There's no rib right there. Very beautiful. Exactly. This, this one is this one is looking very good. Very good finish all the way around. Now this hammer. Tell me about this hammer. Well, if you look at the difference in hammers, this one it has a different angle, and the top of it is knurling. And knurling is when they when they cut a little pattern in, so when you grip it you can cock it easily. And that's what they call the humpback hammer. You don't see many of those. Especially in 22. Exactly. Uh, these guns were made in the day when there was a lot of hand fitting and hand polishing. You can tell by the high, the high degree of finish and, and how bright it is. Uh, that became expensive to do. And so in today's market, you don't see that type of finish. To find pre-war guns in really high condition is hard to do, and they're getting expensive. Another thing to look for when you're uh, looking at a pre-war gun, if you're thinking about buying it, it'll have the serial number matching on the cylinder here, as well as on the barrel right here. So you want to look for that and make sure all your parts match. That's correct, because a lot of people change things around uh, just out of uh, they wanted something different or something got damaged or they sent it back to the factory. Now, another thing, if you look, if you put these side by side, the ejector rod, which ejects the spent casings after you fire, you'll see there's a difference in ejector rods. They went through three or four changes. This one with the large head ejector is different. This one was, uh, was later. And then, of course, on the post-war guns, they all became standardized. Right. So when you start working on these guns, you have to be careful to buy vintage parts that go to that specific gun. And, there, and there's a lot of variation. Plus the threads will be different on that ejector rod. These will be right-hand threads and all the newer guns after what, 60-something, early 60s are left-hand threads. Exactly. It keeps them from unwinding as the gun cycles. Exactly, so uh, there's a lot of people that have damaged these trying to uh, take them off and they're actually tightening them. Yeah, I've seen the plier marks. And it's a very fine thread <laughs> and, and, you, and you can destroy that piece right here and have to get another one. And of course, those hammers and triggers were all color cased, so they're beautiful. These are still beautiful. Both sets still got that. You've got your registration mark there on the hammer, the lettering. These grips are fairly good shape as well. Pre-war grips, you can tell because they're rounded at the top right. to fit the frame, whereas, whereas the later grips, they came up higher. To find original original pre-war grips is, is very difficult and very expensive as well. And sometimes they'll have a gold medallion right here, a recessed medallion. It says Smith & Wesson. It's got the little logo. Sometimes they do not. Smith & Wesson made them both ways. They started with a gold medallion 
then they went to no medallion, mm -hmm. then they went to a silver medallion. So depending on the vintage of your gun, to you know, if you need the correct grips, you have to find out approximately when it was made to try and find the correct grips. That can get pretty confusing. Yes, it can. Now these guns were all basically hand finished. When you look at the way the, the sights blended in, this sight, unlike the, the later guns, this sight is polished along with the top strap. Uh, just a touch of class. Really a nice setup. Um, this is not one you want to knock about in your holster while you're out, uh, you know, skinning alligators or something all day. This is a, uh, this one you take to the range and baby a lot. Beautiful gun. So you've been collecting Smiths for how long? Well, I got into Smith & Wesson's originally when I went in the Air Force in the Law Enforcement Division, and uh, my first experience with a handgun was a Model 15, which is what we were issued and carried. Uh, and I had known nothing about, about handguns prior to that, and, and I immediately liked it. Uh, there's nothing like a single action or double action shooting on a Smith & Wesson. Uh, in my opinion, by far, they're, they're the best. And, uh, and I fell in love with that, and then as time went on, I went to the armory school back in the early 80s and I worked on a lot of Smith and Wessons and then I went, ended up going to gunsmith school. But this really became my favorite revolver, um, especially the pin barrel, which if you see there's a pin right here that holds the barrel on after it's screwed into place. Uh, that pin they deleted in about 1982. But if you talk about a pin barrel, it would have been prior to that. That became uh, my thing to look for, was, was uh, nice pin barrel Smith and Wessons. Um, and that's, that's how I got into this. You got to take the full armors course, right, on revolvers? Yes, it was a two-week class at the yeah. time, and we had to build five guns. From the ground up. From I mean, the ground up. No details left out. Right. Everything was stripped to start with. And, and like all instruction, at least the way I believe it to be, is, is uh, repetition is what, is what makes you remember. If you do it once or just watch it and you don't do it for a year. But um, uh, we did five guns, and we had just transitioned on the police department I was working to the, the, the brand new L friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing I did when we went back is we had we had got 40 new guns, uh, 2686s and 2681s. The first thing I did was I went through 40 guns uh, from start right. to finish. Uh, and I did that on purpose so that that would imprint and I, I wouldn't forget. That was early 80s, I suppose? Yeah. When the L-frame came out? Right. How much of the factory did you get to see while you were there? Uh, I've been back a couple of times and they, uh, it, it's changed a lot since the 80s oh, yeah. until today. Uh, when I went in the 80s, uh, everything, the screw machines were all running uh, full speed and all of this. When I went back about 10 years ago with the new production, with the new MIMS parts guns, all of those machines are just sitting, uh, not being used. Did so you, it's different. Now. Did you get to see the polishing and finishing area? I did, but not as close as I wanted oh. to. I did see the hammer forging area where I was, where I was watching them. And, you, you know, That's pretty from impressive. A, from a gunsmith perspective, you know, everybody else is just kind of wandering around and I'm talking to these guys that are sitting there you know, with a, with a five-ton forge, you okay. know, hammering on parts, and I, I was picking their brain about what are you doing and why and what does it do. And I, that would have been a great tour. And if I could spend a week or two in their polishing room uh, working with them, I'd, I would do that. Tom, if you could just sum up briefly why these revolvers appeal to you so much, why they're your thing, go ahead. Well, when I started in police work, you know, it was a tool, and they have to work, and these work all the time. They, they're extremely accurate. They fit your hand ergonomically. The single action let off on, on the trigger is like no other. Uh, there's, you, there's no better double action trigger pull than a K-frame Smith & Wesson. Um, they just work, they're extremely accurate. And you know, I carried these in police work for 11 years. I carried a Model 19, um, I carried a four inch barrel, and I carried a six inch barrel. And in all of that time, despite, you know, the, the automatics or semi-automatics were coming into vogue, I never felt undergunned. I, this would do exactly what I wanted it to do, and, uh, and it gives you a, a lot of confidence. It's still a great gun. What I like is the workmanship stayed the same, whether you had the high-end target version or you had the fixed sight M&P version that went in the holster every day. What gets overlooked a lot is, is this same gun without sights, the, the Model 10 or the M&P as a pre-Model 10 the same gun, it's the same configuration barrel except it doesn't have adjustable sights and it will still do today what it did in 1905. And it's been used with many many police forces, armed forces. This was the go-to gun uh, for uh, police departments. Yeah. 
the majority of police departments in the country for, for 70 or 80 years. It's a real workhorse. Yes, uh, and it still is. Well, Tom, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Very sir. interesting. You, very you know this is a weakness of mine, Smith & Wesson Revolvers. Yes, I've got more. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. There you go. Let's talk. Good. Thanks for watching. We've had a good time. We hope you have too. Tune in again when we bring you another gun from the vault.